in all of their cells. And you can see that the reliance on plasma glucose increases as you increase your intensity level, as does the breakdown from your, the, of the glucose stores from your muscle. Similarly, if you look at exercise duration, over on the left here, we have somebody doing light aerobic exercise and walking, and over here, somebody doing heavy aerobic exercise. No matter how, how hard it is, over time, again, you're using more plasma glucose or blood sugar. And you can see that when you're exercising longer at a higher intensity level, you also decrease your reliance on being able to break down your glycogen from your muscles and rely more and more on your plasma glucose or your blood sugar. So how do you know how hard you're working? Not everybody can go and do an exercise test and know what their maximal oxygen consumption is, and you certainly aren't doing that when you're doing your everyday physical activities. So a nice way to kind of think about it yourself is to determine how hard you're working by looking at a scale like this. So a rating of perceived exertion scale where if you're in the green and you're exercising very lightly, it might be, I just got off the couch. As you move up the intensity, you can say that at maximum effort or a red 10, that you're climbing Mount Everest with a bear on your back. And the arrow that goes between the lighter yellow and darker yellow shows when you go from aerobic metabolism and reliance mostly on, um, use, on fats to anaerobic metabolism where you are putting out mus more muscle glycogen and more at risk for higher blood glucoses. So again, if you're able to talk and have short conversations and um, doing anything easier than that, then your risk is more for low blood sugars. If you're starting to breathe hard, have a hard time talking, then you're more at risk for high blood sugars. And this is a summary of kind of how to look at that. It's very generalized because it depends on, again, how hard you're working and exactly what you're doing within each activity. But in general, the activities on the top are anaerobic activities. So they're activities where you're working so hard, your intensity is so hard that you're um, not able to use oxygen to break down your glucose. And as a result, you're making um, lactate, which then turns into glucose. And then on the bottom, you have a lot of activities, more endurance sort of activities like running, for example, that are longer duration, possibly lower intensity, more aerobic, and put you at risk for low blood sugar levels. So the second tip I have is knowing what fuel you're using and when you're relying on the sugar in your blood, you need to know the tools to try to keep sugar in your blood to avoid lows or to take sugar out of your blood that's there to avoid highs. So managing blood glucose during exercise is complex, but achievable if you know your tools. The first tool we'll talk about in a little bit is insulin. So when do you give that in relation to exercise? How much insulin do you give? The next tool you have in your box is your carbohydrates or your high glycemic foods. So when do you need to eat those? Mostly to avoid low glucose levels, but also to fuel your body just as an athlete. Another tool you have is time of day. So when are you going to exercise? Are you going to do it before a meal, after a meal, when you wake up, before you go to bed? All of those things will impact how your body reacts. And then lastly, you have the tool we just talked about, which is knowing how hard you're working. Do you want to go out today and do an easier exercise activity, or are you going to be doing something very strenuous? So we'll talk first a little bit about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates as just an athlete, somebody without diabetes, you're, you wouldn't need to fuel your body until about an hour of activity. So that would be our goal for people with type one diabetes too, is to really only fuel your body once your body needs it for energy and not because you have too much insulin in your system. However, a lot of times people with type one diabetes do have too much insulin in their system and in that case, when somebody has exercised over a half hour, then they need, may need to take some carbohydrates to adjust for that activity. So the first goal, which we'll talk about, is to reduce insulin. But if you have high insulin on board, or you've given an injection of short-acting insulin recently, then consuming 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrates per 30 minutes of exercise can help to make sure that you don't have low glucose levels and you want to consider carbohydrates at the high glycemic index. So 
things that I showed in the prior picture, applesauce, raisins, bananas, pretzels, goose, um, Gatorades. Oh, and I'm showing in this picture too. So everyone has their favorite. This is something I'd really encourage you to talk to other people who exercise and have type 1 diabetes about what works for them best. Um, everyone has their own thing that they like that works the best for them. The next tip I have is to minimize your insulin on board. And I think this is really going back to that insulin in your toolbox and probably the most important tool that you have. So let's talk about why managing your insulin is so important. So if you look at the graph here on the left, you can see that whether you're taking a high dose in the solid line or a lower dose in the dotted line of a short acting insulin or a bolus of insulin to cover a meal, it doesn't really peak until about after two hours, it starts to come down. And if you look even at three hours, you still have quite a bit of insulin left in your system. So if you're going to exercise within those first two hours after you eat a meal, you don't want that much insulin in your system or you will for sure have a low blood sugar level. So the guidance that we give right now is that if you're exercising for less than two, less than two hours after you have eaten, that you reduce that dose that you're giving for either correcting a high or for your food by about 50%. There's a range of 25 to 75% because everybody's different and what works for one person won't work for the next, but a good place to start and practice is about by half, to reduce your dose by about half. Um, and then to consume carbohydrates with a lower glycemic index at mealtime. If you're going to exercise more than two hours after you give a short acting insulin dose or a bolus dose, then you want to go ahead and give the full amount because you don't want to have a spike of a high blood sugar in anticipation of exercising and be sitting high for a while. So then you have to pull out that other tool in your toolbox that we talked about, which is your carbohydrates, and you have to consume them to keep your blood sugar levels up high enough. So what do you do with your basal rates or your long acting insulin before exercise? Patients on MDI or multiple daily injections have a little less flexibility Basal insulin doses are usually not adjusted. Some patients who are on twice daily injections of basal insulin may reduce the one dose of insulin where they are more likely to have a low blood sugar level. For patients on insulin pumps, it is very helpful to reduce the basal insulin dose by a range, again, of 60 to 80% if you're exercising or active for longer than 30 minutes. And most people find that helpful if they do it far in advance of activity. So if you can plan better, if you can't, then we have other ways to, to, to make your blood sugar levels stay normal. But if you can plan and reduce that dose up to an hour and a half before exercise, it usually works the best. So again, the range is because everyone's different. I usually say start at a reduction of about 75% and go from there. And then for patients on hybrid closed loop systems or advanced hybrid closed loop, loop systems, there are some functions in those pumps that try to help you avoid low blood glucose levels. So the thing to know is that even though these technol this technology is amazing and really great, it is not meant yet for exercise. It can't just avoid low glucose levels and shut off insulin in anticipation of you exercising or having started exercise. So, for the Medtronic 670G pump, if you're going to exercise before you exercise 30 to 60 minutes if possible, you'd want to put a temporary target in so that your gluco the glucose level being targeted is a little bit higher. And for the Tandem Control IQ, you would want to start exercise activity 30 to 60 minutes before you exercise. Also, we suggest that you do not disconnect your pump, and that would be the next tip. So keep your devices connected. I think in the past, most people who were on insulin pumps disconnected during activities, but now more than ever, especially with these technological systems that are becoming better at controlling your glucose levels and keeping them in a range that you want for life and also for activity, it's important to find a way to keep them on your body. There are uh, rules that protect uh, younger people for wearing them during activities and uh, older people who do wear this technology during recreational activities have found a number of ways to do that successfully. These are some of the ideas that I've heard from people over time. Again, this is another great thing to talk to all of the friends that you've just met or other people on here about and see what they have found that works for them. The flip belt is something that I hear probably more commonly than anything else, which is 
um, a spandex belt that you put your devices in and then you flip it so that they're on the inside against your body. And other, other than the automated systems that are helping or the hybrid closed loop systems, this is another reason that you don't want to disconnect your pump. So this is a study that shows time down here, and this is looking at people that did not disconnect, and this is looking at people that changed out their infusion set and then did disconnect for 30 minutes. And you can see that after resuming basal insulin, glucose levels continue to rise and don't achieve a steady state until about 70 minutes after they've reconnected. And if you look at how much it rose for every minute that insulin infusion was interrupted, your glucose level rises by about one point or one milligram per deciliter. So in the people who did not disconnect, their glucose levels remained very steady. And the last tip that I have is to cool down to prevent post-exercise highs. And this is one of my favorite pictures, and I hope one day I meet um, her or her family. It was taken off of um, a social media website, but she is a high school track star. And I want you all to look really carefully and see if you can find um, where she has her devices connected. I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay. And if you'd like to chat, does anyone want to tell me what they have they see on her? Can anyone find devices? So if you look up here on her, over her scapula, you can see an Omnipod. And then she has a Dexcom um, CGM right here on her abdomen. So when you exercise vigorously and you're breaking down that glucose that is so important for energy for your cells and you don't have enough oxygen around because you've used it all because you're exercising so intensely, you start making lactate. And so lactate can go to your liver, be turned into pyruvate, be turned into glucose and can help fuel your body by providing that glucose. But the problem is, if you have done a lot of anaerobic exercise and have this pathway going, when you stop exercising, you have a lot of lactite, lactate that ends up being turned into a lot of glucose in your bloodstream and you have a spike in your glucose levels. So what can help with this is to do active muscle recovery. By active muscle recovery, meaning maybe slowly on an elliptical or walking, you can actually have the muscle use the lactate and oxidize it so it just goes away and it never turns into glucose. This is a graph showing people who had a passive cool down on the left, meaning they didn't really do much of anything and their lactate level was very high, and people who had an active cool down uh, had a much lower lactate level. So lower lactate equals lower glucose levels in the blood. So hyperglycemia or high blood sugars and early recovery can be attenuated by a prolonged cool down at a moderate intensity. And so what does that mean? That's about 30 to 50% of your maximal oxygen consumption, which really just means that you can talk normally. So a cool down where you can talk normally, whether this is around a track, on a machine, um, in order to reduce your lactate levels, to the most you can, you need to do a cool down for at least 15 minutes, but even 10 minutes does provide benefit. So in summary, the top five, and this is a picture in the background of type one, uh, people with type one diabetes hiking, is understand the fuel that, fuel that you use varies with the intensity, duration, and type of exercise so that you can be more in the moment. By understanding what fuel you're using based on all these things, you know if you're at risk for highs and at risk for lows, and then you can figure out what tools to use. Two is know your tools. Insulin, carbohydrate intake, the timing of your workout, and the intensity of your activity are all things that you have control over and can adjust to try to make sure that you can succeed in what you want to do and not have to uh, stop and let diabetes and glucose levels get in your way. The third tip is to minimize your insulin on board to avoid low blood sugar levels. And this is probably one of the very most important things that you can do. Next is to keep your devices connected when possible. And finally, cool down to avoid post-exercise highs. And with that, I am open for 
questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, feel free guys to put a question within the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, we have one question so far. Um, so at your beginning of your presentation, you showed that graph of uh, different exercises. Um, so does that mean that a less intense exercise is better for weight loss? So, so that's a good question. I was just thinking through that a little bit. There's, there are a lot of different theories about what exercise is best for weight loss, but in general, um, any exercise is actually good for weight loss. In fact, sometimes when you're doing low intensity exercise and you're at risk for low glucose levels, people end up overeating to compensate and they don't lose the weight. So I don't think that one type of exercise is better than another because you're using fuel, you're using energy no matter what type of exercise you're doing. It's just about making sure that you're not eating um, to avoid low glucoses or giving a bunch of extra insulin and then having to eat. Um, to avoid low glucoses. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to, to, you know, doing that mixture as well. Um, so the next question is, what time of day do you recommend for aerobic and anaerobic exercises? So I, I think the time of day um, depends a lot on what works for you and what can work in your schedule. Because any exercise, you know, if you can adjust your day, Optimally, I think that working out first thing in the morning is probably ideal. The reason I think that is because you don't have insulin on board when you first wake up from your meals. And so you have one less factor to worry about when you're trying to figure out how to manage all those tools and try to keep your glucose levels in the range that you want for exercise. Um, having said that, sometimes when you wake up, you can have a cortisol surge and you can have a natural rise in your glucose level. So if you're going and doing weightlifting, that's kind of a double whammy. And so um, that may be something that is okay to do in the afternoon when you um, usually need less insulin and um, are more just naturally at risk for having low glucose levels. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you have any tips to avoid dehydration? Uh, is sugar-free Gatorade as effective as sugar kind to help avoid that? So um, dehydration is really just about fluid intake. Um, with regard to the sugar-free, as far as, uh, um, I'm trying to think more about electrolytes. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I can't remember what they put in all of the different sugar-free drinks and how that could affect um, some of the electrolyte balance. But in general, to avoid dehydration, you just want to be taking in enough fluid. Um, so sugar-free drinks are fine to avoid dehydration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, would uh, working out prior to, well, I guess, the commencement of workout and being in a hyperglycemic state, would that affect your uh, electrolyte balance? Uh, so I think if you're working out with high blood sugars, I'm not really sure how that would affect your electrolytes. You'd be more at risk potentially for dehydration because you are trying to pee out that sugar and you're taking water with it. And then of course, depending how high you are and how long you've been high for, and if that's because you're deficient in insulin, you'd be at risk for increasing ketones, which would be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, the next one, um, how, do you, how does someone go to learn about more uh, details about these tips? Uh, they generally know these principles, but not the science behind them, and they'd love to learn more. Sure. So I think um, there's a couple things. I think that there, there's some videos that we put together as part of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation PEAK program. If you were to just Google JDRF exercise videos, they pop up, and um, they dive a little bit into the science, so um, possibly not as deep as you would like. If you're somebody who is not getting what you need from those videos, which is probably the place I would start, then please feel free to reach out to me and I am happy to provide you with some, some papers and some references and some things that you can read. Awesome. Um, so this person, their ability to do, to do workouts vary so much day to day and it's a real struggle for them to exercise. Could this be due to their diabetes? I think that uh, 
when your blood sugars are in control, um, you are able to feel better and exercise better. So um, depending where your glucose levels are and whether or not you um, have enough insulin in your body, those are things that kind of could definitely affect your ability to exercise in the way that you want to exercise. Awesome. So this next one kind of relates to your blood sugars before a workout. So if someone's blood sugar is above a 200, um, A, is it safe for them to work out? And then B, is it, um, will it like diminish the workout? Like, so it won't be as as strong as a workout? So, you know, I think a lot of these things have very limited evidence to, um, to inform our decisions. So we have limited evidence and then make our best advice based on that. Currently, the American Diabetes Association guidelines, which were just rewritten to kind of beef up the exercise portion, recommend that for safety, your blood sugar is between 90 and 250 when you're exercising. Based on data, we have having glucose levels uh, more in the 100s between, you know, 120s to 180s will probably allow you to actually use your energy most efficiently and feel good and have a good workout when you exercise. Yeah. So this one's going to talk, uh, it's asking more about the insulin analog that you use. So based on your expertise um, in exercise, uh, would using a, like a shorter uh, lifespan like FIAS be more, um, I guess, optimal versus other forms like Nova Rapid? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. You know, I think that we don't have um, evidence, we don't have anything looking at that. So anything I would say would just be offhand. And I actually don't have enough patient or enough athletes, I should say, on FIAS to even be able to give my opinion just based on um, what I see. So um, I think, you know, because it is faster onset, potentially, if you were starting off with a higher glucose level, that that could potentially be helpful, but um, anything I would say right now is just kind of speculative. Awesome. Great. Um, so far, that's all the questions we have right now. Um, if anybody else keeps putting it through the chat, um, do you have any other, I guess, advice from your expertise? Because you're an athlete yourself. So is there any tips or tricks that you use? I think that you just each type of activity you do is going to be different. And in order for you to be able to really enjoy that activity, it does take some trial and error. And so don't be afraid to do what you want to do and to just know that you need to start at a baseline using hopefully some of the tips we talked about and adjust from there. Um, don't feel afraid to reach out to your doctor. You can um, certainly feel free to reach out to me or other people you've connected with this weekend. I think that, um, something to kind of know is that if you are on a hybrid closed loop pump that um, the temporary target or the exercise activity doesn't mean that you want to turn it on during every exercise activity. You want to turn it on for exercises where you're at risk for low glucoses, but if you're doing a um, kind of exercise that is more anaerobic and results in higher glucoses, usually you, you wouldn't want to turn that on because you um, actually would want more insulin in your system for the most part. Um, and and I, I think an important message, uh, I do some work with Diabetes Training Camp too, and what, what they say, which I really like how they frame things is, um, you are a active person or an athlete first and somebody with type one diabetes second. And so you need to exercise or do your activity in the most healthy way possible that anybody with or without diabetes would do to be successful and then figure out how to do the best based on using those tools to keep your glucose levels in range. Awesome. Um, I have a personal question. What is your go-to low snack? <laughs> uh, <laughs> for exercise or for just in general? <laughs> oh, all the above. If there's different ones. No, I don't even know that I have a great one. You know, to be honest, I, the best thing is really to have a small amount of like I call it liquid sugar, like juice or something like that. Um, because all the other ones that I try, I feel like take a while to kick in. I feel like that kicks in the fastest. All the things I try to take with me when I go and exercise, I have to struggle for a few minutes until it, they kick in. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same thing. It's always the juice box for me. Yeah. 
Um, so we have two questions here. Um, do you have a go-to source to recommend uh, to hear about more athletes of being successful? Um, so Beyond T1D has a lot of, they've done a lot of interviews with athletes who have been successful, who have um, type 1 diabetes. I believe they even have an area on there where it lists all of the athletes that they know of that have type 1 diabetes. So I would definitely check out that resource. Sweet. Um, so gyms are going to be opening soon. Uh, do you have any opinion on uh, comfort level of resuming to go back? Oh, geez. That's a tough question. <laughs> That's a really tough question. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think what's hard about this question is that we just don't know. We still don't have all the information we need to have about, um, you know, how you completely try to stay safe. I think there's all, and, and why certain people get sick and others don't as much from um, what's going on right now. So I personally wouldn't be one of the first ones into the gym. I would kind of wait and see how things go um, before I did that, but I'm a little bit more cautious at baseline. Nice. Great. Okay. So that is basically on the dot at seven o'clock. Um, we have answered all the questions. Thank you so much for everyone who uh, came in and tuned in tonight. Uh, the five tips for exercise and diabetes, uh, definitely going to apply that within my exercise regimen. So thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Bye, Bye guys. Thank you. Hopefully see you uh, at seven o'clock. Oh, um, actually one more thing. I apologize. If, if you could possibly fill out this survey, everyone, that I'm going to post in the channel uh, throughout the, uh, every session, if you could provide feedback, that'd be really useful for future Connected Motion events. Sweet. Thanks, everyone. Get some food. And hopefully hear from you soon. I think Crystal Bowersox is going to play. She's a pretty uh, amazing artist, so I'm really excited. Awesome. Everyone's saying thank you. Thank you.